As we continue our study in the book of Revelation, we are now in chapter 12. The seventh trumpet has already sounded, and so we await the seven bowls, which are the content of that last trumpet. Seventh trumpet has in it seven bowls, but we're, we don't get there in chapter 12. In chapter 12, we see an insertion, and it's quite a strange insertion. It's an insertion that includes a sign about the woman, the child, and the dragon, and there's war on earth, and there's war in heaven. Chapter 12 is quite different. It's very apocalyptic, and it's very strange. There's no transition in the text. There's no, and later I saw, or after these things. It just immediately jumps into the vision. And this brings up the issue of the chronological arrangement of the book of Revelation. So I would like to suggest that as far as the basic backbone of this section, chapter 1 is first. It happened first. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 were contemporary with John. Chapters 4 through the end of the book are about what must happen after these things. So now in this section of uh, seals, trumpets, bowls. What's, what's the chronological arrangement? I think it reads very well to take these things chronologically. The first seal, the second seal, the third seal, the fourth seal, the sixth seal, the seventh seal, the first trumpet, etc. Then the seven bowls. Take those chronologically and take the end chapters chronologically. The millennium is followed by the great white throne judgment, which is followed by the new creation of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem comes down from the new heaven to the new earth. All that can be very well read chronologically, but these insertions are a different matter. And here we will see in this insertion that it's wildly not chronological. Well, it breaks the chronological flow, absolutely, because... and. It seems the other insertions, too, are not bound by the chronological arrangement that is just normal chronology in the rest of the book. The insertions are wild chronologically, but thematically they are structured. Okay, so now, this insertion that we're going to see here in chapter 12, it speaks of events far separated in time. Satan's rebellion in heaven, the Lord Jesus' birth, the hostility between Satan and Christ. This vision in Revelation 12 has some similarity with Isaiah 26, 16 through 27, 1, where the nation of Israel is compared to a woman in labor. The nation of Israel is compared to a woman in labor. And God kills the dragon who lives in the sea in the end times. So you may want to read Isaiah 26, 16 through the first verse of chapter 27 in connection with this passage. Chapter 12 speaks about war on earth in verses 1 through 6, and then war in heaven, verses 7 through 12, and then again back to war on earth, 13 through 17. So let's look at the first block, war on earth, chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 12, verse 1, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Hmm. The word sign is prominent in this section here. This, it starts out, and a great sign appeared. We're going to see some metaphorical, some figures of speech here, because some say that this woman is Mary? Well, that doesn't fit with what we just saw about Isaiah 26, where the woman symbolized Israel in birth. So it's not, it's, and, and furthermore, this woman is still alive at the end times. So it's better to take this woman here as a sign for Israel, and in fact, believing Israel. I say believing Israel because later we'll see that these, th this woman is protected by God and it links very strongly with Romans 11 where we have believing Israel. In Genesis 37 verse 9, 
the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars represent Jacob, Rachel, and 11 of the sons of Jacob. This is a beautiful vision. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. This woman is greatly honored in this vision. The moon is her footstool. Wow. It's like, but not like, the dream in Genesis 37, which we frequently have, like, but not like, as we go back into the Old Testament references. The crown that this woman has is a Stephanos. It's a victor's crown, not a royal diadema crown, a victor's crown, a Stephanos. Chapter 12, verse 2. And being pregnant, she was screaming in labor pains and struggling to give birth. Remember, back in Isaiah 26, Israel is compared to a woman in labor. Israel is also pictured as a woman in labor in Isaiah 66, 7 through 11, and Micah 4, 10. There's also a Dead Sea Scrolls reference, him E in the Kump from the Qumran. There's a woman in labor that's about to deliver the wonderful counselor. So this was not a subtle, hidden theme in the Hebrew scriptures. This was well known, so well known that it even shows up in a Qumran scroll. Chapter 12, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. And look, a huge, fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven crowns. As is very clear in 12.9, this is the devil concerning the seven heads and the ten horns. Note Revelation 17, 9 through 13, Daniel 7, 7, and 7, 24. This dragon had seven crowns. These are not Stephanoi. These are diadema. These are kingly crowns. You might say, well, the devil doesn't have the right to wear a kingly crown. No, he doesn't. This is an arrogant, blasphemous being who is claiming to have kingly authority by wearing seven crowns. But he has no right to it, in fact. He is a presumptuous liar. Chapter 12, verse 4. And his tail sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven, and he threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman as she was about to give birth, so that whenever she gave birth, he could devour her child. Wow. In one verse here, two sentences in English translation, we have, well, what appears to be the fall of Satan with, or the fall of a third of the angels of heaven. Let's talk about that in a moment. And then immediately, in the very next sentence, it jumps to the birth of the Lord Jesus and the attempts of the devil to destroy that child. That's a huge, how many thousand years was that? We don't even know. <laughs> it's a huge jump. Well, so again, these insertions can do strange things with time. Well, Job 38 verse 7 and Revelation 9 1 seem to speak of angels as stars. So we don't know about the physics of this, but it's, or maybe it's just some kind of a metaphor that angels are, can be referred to as stars. Well, his tail, the dragon's tail, swept away a third of the stars of heaven. A closely related text is Daniel 8, 10, which speaks of the little horn that grew out of one of the goat's four horns, and it says, It grew until the host of the heavens, and it threw to the earth some of the host and some of the stars and trampled them. Oh, wow, this is apocalyptic, wild apocalyptic language. This seems to be a reference back to Isaiah 14, where the devil the angel named Lucifer became the devil, and many, here a third, 
of the angels, of the holy angels, followed him in rebellion. That seems to be what this means, but in passages like this, we can't be dogmatic. The dragon stood before the woman to devour the child. Well, we read in the, in the synoptic gospels, we read about the birth of the Lord Jesus, and we read about the efforts of King Herod to destroy that child. Here we learn that the devil was behind King Herod's efforts to destroy he that was born king of the Jews. Chapter 12, verse 5. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will shepherd all the nations with an iron staff. And her child was snatched away to God and to his throne. Well, the male child is clearly Jesus Christ. He is to become king of kings and lord of lords. He will shepherd all the nations with an iron rod. Hmm, this refers back to Psalm 2, 9. The word shepherd is strange for us in this context, but in the Hebrew scriptures, to shepherd is often used to speak metaphorically of to rule. He will, we might, we can loosely translate, he will rule all the nations with an iron staff. Iron staff speaks, this is not a gentle ruling here. He will rule with an iron staff. He will shepherd all the nations with an iron staff is Again, Psalm 2, 9, but see also Revelation 2, 27, and 19, 15. So the focus in this verse is the, it's about the birth of Christ, and it's about his future kingly reign, and then her child was snatched away to God and to his throne. It's about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ from the Mount of Olives up into heaven. What strange things apocalyptic texts can do in these signs. We read about the first Christmas, and then fast forward through all of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus as he lived in the land of Israel, in Galilee, and in Jerusalem, and all his ministries there. And it doesn't even mention the cross, his resurrection, and it just immediately jumps to, he was snatched up into heaven. He was taken up into heaven, his ascension into heaven. Well, that's what apocalyptic literature can do. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that they could care for her for 1,260 days. Now, that last verse was about the ascension of the Lord Jesus into heaven, and suddenly now we fast forward to the midpoint of the tribulation, the seven years. Why do I say midpoint? Because of the 1,260 days, the 42 months, the time, times and half a time, the three and a half years, at this midpoint, she, Israel, not Mary, who is doesn't need to flee anywhere, not Mary, but the believing Israel, flees into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that they, it just says they, it does say they. Some translations don't like that, but it says they, and we don't know who the they is, so that they could care for her for this 1,260 days, which we discussed earlier is the second half of the seven years of the tribulation the years of persecution by Antichrist, the beast. Note also Revelation 7, 1 through 8, 11, 2, and 11, 5 through 7 about this. Now, chapter 12, verse 7 through 12, shifts from this basically earthly from this basically earthly conflict up to war in heaven. Well, in this section, John tells about the war from a heavenly perspective. One difficulty in interpreting this, these verses right here is whether this is a broad perspective view of all the history of the world, which could be in apocalyptic time perspective, time frame. Sure, that could be. Or is it about 
one special battle at the end of the age. Well, the joy and praise of 1210 seems to be parallel with the joy and praise of 19, 1 through 9, at the end of the seven years. So that seems to suggest that this passage that we're about to look at is about one special conflict at the end of the age, rather than a a uh, broad perspective of all of the conflict between God and his angels and the devil and his fallen angels throughout all of existence. <laughs> so verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon, and the dragon battled with his angels. The angel named Michael Michael, who is like God, appears in Daniel 12, 11 as a protector of the nation of Israel, which he's doing here too. Chapter 12, verse 8, and he was not strong, neither could a place be found for him in heaven. So at some point in time in the war in heaven, Satan and his fallen angels are so beaten back that they can find no place perhaps meaning no place to gather, stand, and fight. They have no place. This probably meant a lot more to people that have been involved in the hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords in ancient warfare. You need a place to stand. You need a place to gather and rest your sword arm. And there was no place for them. They were routed. Chapter 12, verse 9. And he was thrown, the great dragon, the ancient snake, the one called devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown to the earth and his angels with him were thrown. We may have to just take a step back here. This is not a course in Satanology and the study of Satan, but it might help to think about the stages of the existence of the devil. We know from Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, we, that an angel fell from heaven. So Luc Lucifer, God created Lucifer, meaning shining one, light one, but he rebelled. And at, at some point in his existence, we don't know how long it took after his creation, he rebelled from heaven and he and those that joined him were cast out of heaven. But we know from various passages, Job 1, 6 through 12, and 2, 1 through 6, and Zechariah 3, 1 through 2, we know, that, and we know that the devil, even today, the devil is our accuser. He can go, he has access, not residence, but access to heaven and go and accuse us before God. So, first stage, he lives in heaven as a pure angel named Lucifer. Second stage, he's cast down to earth, but he still has access. He can still be the accuser. He's the accuser of our brothers. But this now that we just are reading about here seems to say that he is cast out completely and has no access to God anymore. He can't even go there to accuse us. That seems to be how it is that he's cast out in Isaiah, but he's also cast out permanently, utterly, without any access here at this point. That seems to be a good understanding of what has happened to and will happen to the devil. The term devil, diabolos, is from the Greek word accuser or slanderer. And the term, the name Satan, is from the Hebrew word meaning adversary. The use of the expression the ancient snake reminds the reader of his role in the Garden of Eden, in which he uh, deceived Eve and was cursed by the Lord God. There. Chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now is the victory and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, 
the one who accuses them day and night before our God. So again, we have the now is the victory, and yet the, because the seventh trumpet has been blown, and if the seventh trumpet has been blown, then the seven bowls of judgment that are contained in that seventh trumpet are certain. But the final victory has not yet come. Oh, the word I translate victory here is the Greek word soteria. Three times it's used in the book of Revelation. All three times it's often translated salvation because the word often means salvation or deliverance. But here it's better taken as victory. God does not need a salvation, but God does win victories. And this is a victory of God here victory and power in the kingdom of our God. Why? Because the accuser is thrown down. Again, in, at this point in our lives, the devil is the accuser. He has access to heaven to accuse, and it'll be a great thing when the day comes when he can no longer accuse. And that'll be wonderful for heaven. That's great for heaven. Hmm. It's not very pleasant for the people on the earth. We will see in a moment. Chapter 12, verse 11. This is a wonderful verse, a very significant verse about what that tells us a lot about what God is doing and wants of us in the book of Revelation. Very insightful verse for us here. Let's look at it. Chapter 12, verse 11. And they were victorious over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. Hmm. After hearing about one aspect of Satan's defeat in heaven, now this verse 11 shifts to earth, and here we read about a, the defeat of the devil on earth. Well, there's a heavenly part of this battle. That's, that's Michael's job in the future. And there's an earthly part of this battle. And we can be involved in that. How can we be involved in that? <laughs> Let's look at this verse carefully. First off, this word victorious is very significant for us, we, for us that are reading the book of Revelation. It's that verb, nikao, to win, to be victorious, to the victor I will give, to the overcomer, the NIV translation. And we read that the devil is victorious. Often we read about the devil being victorious by killing people. But here, believers, some believers are victorious. In Revelation 2 and 3 also, some believers, not all the believers, but some believers in Revelation 2 and 3 are also victorious. And here we read about some believers that are victorious. We know the devil is victorious by killing. How are believers to be victorious? Ah, okay, we have to look closely at this verse. These believers are victorious by the blood of the Lamb. By, because of the gospel, there is a victory. But it doesn't end there. It isn't just, oh, gospel, period, victory. No, it goes on. By the word of their testimony. And remember, word and testimony are linked together in about five passages. Usually it's the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, word of God and testimony of the Lamb. Here it's just the word of their testimony. So those are all, those ideas are compacted here. They're victorious because of the gospel, They're victorious because of their preaching of the gospel. And third, they did not love their lives unto death. So what do we have here? How can we be victorious over the devil? Can we kill him? Do we pick up a sword and slay the devil? That's not what this passage is talking about. In this passage, we... And these tribulation, faithful tribulation saints are victorious. How? 
Can we be victorious? How are they victorious? Again, because of the gospel and because of preaching the gospel, but preaching the gospel in a way fearlessly, without regard of the, I could die in this, so I don't want to do it. Being faithful unto death, back in the letter to Smyrna. That's how these people in this verse in chapter 12 are victorious over the devil. That's the victory on this earth. There's, sure, there's warfare victory with swords. The angels have swords and they have their victory in heaven. But on earth, the victory against the devil is by believing the gospel, preaching the gospel, preaching the, the word and the testimony. Seems to be gospel preaching, Bible teaching, gospel teaching. And doing so without fear of death. They did not love their lives to death. They were, they loved God more than their lives, even to the point of dying. That's victory for us. And you say, wait a minute, where's the victory? They die. Yes, they die, but they're victorious. That's not victory. Well, the believers in Smyrna would disagree. That is the victory that the believers in Smyrna want to pursue. That is the victory that martyrs, faithful servants of God that preached and were killed for it through the ages have pursued. That's the victory that Polycarp saw he was attaining when he was burned alive for preaching the gospel. That's the victory. That would, the people in Laodicea, the worldly people in Laodicea would laugh at that kind of victory. But the people in Smyrna would say, wow, I'm rich spiritually, even though I'm poor physically, and even though I'm a loser physically, because I've lost, everything's been taken from me physically, I'm a victor spiritually. They would understand this. Let's be sure we understand this kind of victory. Let's be sure we pursue this kind of victory and not the kind of victory where we just put down other people and crush other people to make ourselves look good. There's two kinds of victory in the book of Revelation. Let's make sure we're living, pursuing that victory of the Lord Jesus upon the cross, that victory described here. Faithful, preach, believing the gospel, preaching the gospel, faithful all the way to death. So that was verse 11. In our next lecture, we'll pick up again with chapter 12, verse 12.